Greetings, Daily Spoons, and welcome back to another episode of Monday Madness, the Monday show where I talk about pretty much anything and everything and do pretty much anything and everything that is taking my fancy recently. And I realise that I haven't done a lot of Peter Pan content recently. This is partly because I have been focusing on other things, and also partly because I have been frantically moving across a lot of my content over onto the official Peter Pan Facts TikTok page, and also because I have a lot of deadlines coming up to do with the Never Never movie project that I am doing, so, um... So yeah, I sort of got distracted by that and didn't realise that I hadn't been sharing a lot of that content with you guys, instead I've just been sort of making my own. So today I am going to bring you some Peter Pan content in the form of a sort of character study of a character I haven't talked about that much on this channel, and her name is Wendy Darling. She's grown on me more the more I have grown. Uh, I think I just understand her more. I still do not relate to her in the slightest, but I understand her character better than I did as a child. So today, well, this video is technically a defence for Wendy Darling, <laughs> while I'm also tearing apart the 2003 Peter Pan movie, because that movie, for all of its merits, and there are quite a few, I can go and watch my very old, I really want to redo this video, but I did do a review of the 2003 movie, where in basic terms I got to sum up why it was a failure of an adaption for me, and it really only came down to a couple of key points, which were very sad. Uh, but as I said in that review, it did a lot of things wonderfully well. For example, Jason Isaacs playing Captain Hook, he is one of, if not my favourite Captain Hook of all time. He is absolutely fantastic, I love everything he did with that role, except for some of the scripting things they gave him to say at the end. But again, that was the script and not him as an actor. I have forgotten her name and I'm very sorry, but the lady who played Mrs Darling, she was absolutely spectacular. Exactly exactly what you imagine Mrs Darling would look like. She is just phenomenal. She did everything right. She was fantastic as well. And also, of course, Jason Isaacs playing Mr Darling. He did a very good job there as well. Again, the script let them down, but as actors doing their best, they did a really good job with that. Jeremy Sumter as Peter Pan I also really enjoyed. He was a little too human for me, but again, that comes from he was only like 13 when he was filming it, and also the scripting as well. But overall, as an adaption, I give it a 6 out of 10, and I'm not going to talk too much more about the adaption because that's what the other review that I will probably redo in the future is for, but today I just wanted to mention it because some of those points do come up as I am discussing the character of Wendy Darling. Alright, so, welcome to today's video. <laughs> today's Monday Madness video, which I'm going to entitle something along the lines of, um, A Defence for Wendy Darling, and why the 2003 Peter Pan movie failed her spectacularly. So let me know down in the comments below some of your favourite strong characters. They can be female, female presenting, any gender you would like. Just tell me your favourite strong characters and strong character moments and things like that. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I will try to read as many as I possibly can. Do you like my shirt? I really like this shirt. This is like, this is my ultimate Gilmore shirt. I'm feeling very Gilmore-y today. Side note, no, someone asked me, lots of people asked me this before, um, no, I will never cosplay Sean Gilmore because I am a twinky white boy and I'm I'm not gonna cosplay Gilmore because he is not a twinky white boy. <laughs> I mean, twinky is, I guess, open for debate, but uh, Gilmore is canonically not a white man, so I am not going to be cosplaying him because I do not feel that would be right. But inspired by him, absolutely, every damn day. This bit is probably going to get a bit long, so I'm going to edit it. Sorry to future editing me. But basically, before we start talking about the movie itself, I want to talk about the reason why I think it failed Wendy Darling as a character. This is kind of serious, so I'm going to put the hot chocolate down. What the 2003 Peter Pan movie, along with a lot of other adaptions of the Peter Pan story, including several stage versions that I've seen, including the Royal Shakespeare Company's Wendy and Peter Pan, as you can tell from the title, they made it into Wendy's story, Something that I have found with more modern adaptations of the story of Peter Pan, particularly in regards to Wendy Darling's character, is they all seem to feel that she needs to be rewritten. They seem to feel like she needs to be made stronger. And while it's not every modern adaption of this story, it is a lot of them. Enough that it makes me slightly concerned that these people who are writing and editing and making all this stuff have either not read the original story and just seen the Disney movie and gone, oh god, we need to fix that, which by the way, we, we agree on that, or that they have read the original story but they've more skimmed it and ignored the crucial things that are actually happening and reading in between the lines and sometimes just reading the blatantly obvious because clearly Clearly they're missing something. To be fair, expecting anyone to have read and understood and researched this story quite as much as me is probably a bit too much to ask, but that's why they should be hiring people like me to help them. What the Royal Shakespeare Company in this, plus a lot of modern adaptions, including the 2003 movie, did with Wendy Darling's character is they erased her essentially. By trying to make her a stronger character, they actually removed everything that made her strong 
in the first place. So what are people looking for when they say a strong female slash female presenting character? Well, a trap that a lot of modern writers seem to fall into when trying to create a strong female or female presenting character these days is that they just give them a sword. Or outside the realms of fantasy, they just make them physically strong, or they make them win all the time, or they make them Saki and a badass boss bitch who's always on top of everything. And while, yes, that is strong, and there are some people out there in the world who are like that, that's not the cut and dry all there is to make a strong character of any gender, to be honest. And I feel that people are really missing the mark here when they are trying to edit and adapt Wendy Darling into a strong character. A quick example to draw from some other media is the Lord of the Rings movies. Not the source material, not all the deleted scenes, not the extended editions, just the movies as theatrically released. And we have the characters of Eowyn and Arwen. And in a lot of internet discourse and a lot of discussions I've had with people about these two characters, a lot of people tend to dismiss Arwen and believe that she is weak. Meanwhile, Eowyn, who is fighting and brandishing her sword and being physically strong, she is everything. She is everything that Arwen is not. However, I would argue that Arwen actually has inner strength. It's invisible to the eye. She's not physically strong brandishing a sword. Yes, I know there are deleted scenes where she was at Helm's Deep, but we didn't get to see that in the movie, so for the argument's sake, Arwen's strength is almost invisible. It's emotional inner strength, it's conviction of character, to do the right thing, to never choose the easy route. And while yes, Eowyn does have physical strength and is fantastic and a great role model, you can't dismiss characters like Arwen just because they're not brandishing a sword. Speaking of just brandishing a sword, yeah, that's what I feel like the 2003 movie did to Wendy Darling. Something that I feel like all of these people script writing or reimagining strong versions and editing old characters into strong new ones, yeah, something I think they forget is that there are a lot of people out there in the world who will relate to characters who don't want to brandish a sword, who don't want to fight, who aren't physically strong, or who are physically strong but don't use it that way. And they have inner strengths and other strengths, and they are strong in so many varieties of other ways other than just physically brandishing a sword. And I feel like that's a very cheap and very lazy way to try and present someone as a strong character, no matter what gender they are. Specifically talking about female and female presenting ones for Wendy Darling, though, I feel like by just thrusting a sword into her hand and saying, look, isn't she strong? She's fighting with the boys! you're kind of robbing her of everything her original character was, and thereby telling all of these people who related to her original character, or who would have related to it if only you'd shown it in the adaption, you're telling them that they're not strong, and that they are not worthy of being a main character, that they need to change, and in order to be strong they have to be completely different to who they actually are. And I'm never going to be okay with that. So what about the original Wendy Darling then? What made her strong? Well, fun fact, J.M. Barry himself wrote that until Wendy came, her mother was the chief one in the house. And we see this in the scenes that the Darling family has together. Wendy actually is the person who is on top of everything. Mrs. Darling and Mr. Darling, sure, they're wonderful parents, very devoted, very loving, but Mr. Darling is very prideful and loses himself in that, and Mrs. Darling ends up losing herself a little bit in the worry and the nightmares about Peter coming to take her children. Hey, doggo. Don't worry, the dog will appear in this video. He's, ha he's having a roar. Can you, can you tell? Come here, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hello. Hello. Were you having a roll? Is that what you were doing? Were you, were you doing a little roly poly? Is that what you were doing? Oh, hello. Hey, buddy. Oh, yes. Say hi. Say hi to all the people. I mean, there's not that many people. I appreciate everyone who does watch these videos. But in realistic terms, it's not like you're saying hi to millions, is it, Pop? Oh, you're such a good dog, though. If this was just a dog channel, I, I would be on millions. Millions of subscribers, wouldn't we, Pop? Yeah, what do you reckon? And that is one of Wendy's biggest strengths. She's a leader. 
Not in the same way as Peter Pan, Tiger Lily, or Captain Hook, Wendy Darling is the leader of the family around her, the head of the household in a way. In fact, John, Michael, and even Wendy's parents look to her for answers when they are seeking the truth. Wendy is the one who corrects her family when they say that Nana is barking because she is sad to be left outside, when actually Wendy says, no, she's barking to warn us of incoming danger. Mrs. Darling also listens to Wendy's opinions and ideas, and even though she has trouble believing what Wendy is saying, she doesn't outright dismiss it and eventually realises that Wendy was in fact telling the truth, particularly about the leaves that were found at the foot of the nursery window and the visits from Peter Pan himself. Wendy Darling is also responsible for moving a lot of the plot along. A lot of her decisions affect the course of the narrative. For example, it was Wendy who said to Peter that she knows lots of stories that she could tell to the Lost Boys, and that is what made Peter decide to offer to bring her to the Neverland with him. If Wendy hadn't been the person who first hinted at that idea, Peter may very well have just left with his shadow, returned a few times to listen to the stories, but that may have been it. Wendy is also the one who asks to bring John and Michael to the Neverland as well. There's a whole lot of other things that Wendy does over the course of the narrative, and I've talked about those in other videos, and I will continue to do so in another video. Wendy does a lot of things that influence the course of the story. Wendy is also in charge of the home under the ground, she looks after the Lost Boys, and they all respect her. In fact, they respect her the minute that she shows up on the Neverland. They do not want to touch her because they might get her dirty while she's passed out after being shot by Tootles with an arrow, and so they build a house around her so that they can protect her, but they don't want to pick her up and move her. They ask her to behave as their mother, rather than assuming that she will, and are in fact very scared that she'll say no. Meaning that Wendy did in fact have the agency to say, no, I don't want to play as your mother, but because of the type of character that she is, she wanted to have that role, and so she got it. And that's another thing as well. While I personally have never related to this kind of character, and never will, I do not have a paternal bone in my friggin body, I still respect the hell out of people who are. People who have paternal, maternal, parental instincts, people who want to have a family, people who are very nurturing and caring and great with kids and stuff and they want to do all of that and they want to raise a family and build a home. I respect the hell out of people for that. That's great, and that is a perfectly valid way to want to live your life, and it's a perfectly valid personality, and it's also a perfectly valid form of strength. You can be a strong mother, you can be a strong mother figure, you can be a strong sister, or sibling, or auntie, or distant cousin five million times removed. Wanting to be a mother, wanting to grow up, wanting to nurture people, wanting any of that does not mean you're not a strong character. It just means you have a different kind of strength to the characters who are physically strong or who are out there brandishing a sword. So now let's talk about the 2003 Peter Pan movie and discuss just where it went wrong and what they were trying to do with that version of Wendy Darling. The first thing that we learn about the 2003 movie portrayal of Wendy Darling is that she is enacting the story of Cinderella to her brothers. She's calling herself Cinderella, she's wearing toy armour, she's got a toy sword, and she's telling the story of Cinderella. But it's not the story of Cinderella that a lot of us will know and be familiar with. It's a new version. It's Wendy's own version. Cinderella is fighting with a sword and flying through the air and defeating all the bad guys, and arguably being pretty badass. Also, anyone claiming that the Disney Cinderella is weak and not a strong character? Uh, yeah, go watch it again, and also watch the sequels. Just saying. Wendy fights John, playing at being a pirate, and John calls her girly, and Wendy as Cinderella says, who be you to call me girly, and they have their fight and stuff. It's a very fun, sweet scene, but it is giving us a very important piece of information about Wendy Darling's character. Everything that Wendy Darling has done to Cinderella by making her have a sword and fight and do things like that, that is what this movie is trying to do to Wendy Darling. And not well. Let's continue. We later learn that Wendy Darling has an unfulfilled ambition. She wants to write an epic novel in three parts about all of her adventures that she's yet to have. Now that's fine. Wendy Darling wanting to grow up and tell stories, that fits with her character absolutely. Wendy Darling is and always has been a storyteller. She told stories to the Lost Boys, she told stories to her daughter Jane, Jane's daughter Margaret, etc, etc. Also while I'm talking about this, please go and check out my making Neverland characters into D&D &D characters because I think you'll enjoy what I did to Wendy Darling. We then have the slightly weird scene with Aunt Millicent, who is not a character from the original story, but I talked about this more in my original review of the movie. Aunt Millicent is talking about how Wendy Darling now is growing into being a woman, and she has a hidden kiss, just like Mrs. 
darling, her mother. The hidden kiss is greatly significant in the story of Peter Pan, but in this movie they make it significant in a completely different way. They build it up like you get a hidden kiss and you're supposed to find the big adventure, which is who the kiss belongs to, aka just, you know, find the love of your life, I guess. And while that would be fine in any other story, that's not what the story of Peter Pan is about, and it's very strange that they did that to Wendy. Also, at no point in the original story did Wendy Darling have the hidden kiss, it was just something to describe Mrs. Darling. It didn't seem to be something that was passed down in their family, it is just something Mrs. Darling had that made her even more of just this ugh, beautiful anomaly of a character. But anyway, I can sort of get over that, and Aunt Millicent being this weird extra added character. <laughs> Ignoring all of that though, something that was really bugging me about that particular particular scene is that they changed Mr. and Mrs. Darling's perspectives on their children. In the original story, they're just very loving, devoted, caring parents. Sure, Mr. Darling has his pride and ego that he has to get over in his own character arc by the end of the story, but at no point do the parents in the original Peter Pan story say to Wendy that she needs to go into her own room and she needs to grow up and stop telling stories or anything like that. They just support her, and I find it very strange that people started incorporating that. Again, I blame Disney. They seem to think that Wendy needs a struggle, and for some reason the struggle is against her parents who are forcing her to grow up. Now, in the original story, Wendy Darling actually is described as the kind who likes to grow up. She wants to grow up, she's happy to do so. She actually ends up growing up one day earlier than everyone else of her own age because she is so ready to do it. So giving her this struggle of battling against the wills of her parents and Aunt Millicent about growing up and stuff not only goes against her original character who would have had no such struggle at all, not just because her parents wouldn't have done that and also because she wanted to grow up, but it also ignores the fact that Wendy had other struggles in the original story. She doesn't need a new one. In particular, not this one. But we're gonna put a pin in that for a second and we will come back to that later on. I'm also gonna completely gloss over the scene where Wendy is drawing in her notebook in school and then gets scolded by the teacher for drawing Peter Pan and her in bed. It's just, it's embarrassing, it's awkward, it's completely unnecessary and was just done for some slapstick humor of Nan and the dog going sliding on the floor and papers going flying. None of that was necessary and to be honest, it's wasted screen time that could have been used on something else. But anyway, moving on. Something else that was strange to me that really just sticks in my head is the heart-shaped cutout at the bottom of Wendy's bed. This is used as a framing device when Wendy and Peter are speaking to each other and you literally see their faces talking to each other through this heart shape framing their face and that is definitely a setup for a big big issue I have with something at the end of the movie and that's where they make Peter Pan and Wendy Darling into a pair of romantic leads. Ignoring the fact that they are literal children which I can't, I can't ignore that. It's so gross and horrible on so many levels. Ignoring the fact that it goes completely against Peter's character and robs him of just so, so much, it also takes a lot away from Wendy's character. It's a beautiful framing device, but it really doesn't add anything, and if anything, it only takes away from her character, really. I'll come back to this a little later on when I'm talking about the fairy dance scene and then that horrible turning pink moment, but something else I noticed in the nursery scene, particularly while they kept some moments from the original play and book, like where Wendy is offering to give Peter a kiss and he doesn't know what it is, so she gives him a thimble, Wendy immediately then forgets that she has given him a thimble and offers her cheek to him, and while that did happen in the original story and was very funny, the way that they did that in the nursery scene in the 2003 movie just... it made Wendy a lot sappier and more pathetic. Not quite as pathetic as the Disney version, good god. Again, like using the heart-shaped framing device, it, it only took away. They, they did too much. Less is more sometimes, you know, and that moment definitely needed a lot less. And then, of course, Peter convinces her to come away to the Neverland and fly out of the window with him. And yes, the music is amazing. Yes, I love that flying music. Yes, it's wonderful. Let's move on now. <laughs> a small thing that I wrote down while I was rewatching this movie to write this video was that Wendy Darling doesn't save herself from a brick wall that's coming up while she's flying. Now, what they were drawing from there, I'm going to give them the grace of assuming, is that in the original source material, the Darling children, while they were learning how to fly, they didn't know how to stop yet because Peter hadn't taught them how. If you want to go find out more about the flight to the Neverland and how dark it actually was, yeah, go look up my dark Neverland facts videos. Anyway, yes, drawing from the source material, Wendy did not know how to stop flying yet. But there was nothing that meant she couldn't have dodged it herself. It was just another example of a moment that did not need to be in there and was maybe 10 seconds of screen time that could have been used for something else. The only reason they included it was because they wanted Peter to save her and pull her out of the way because they wanted to add more to this, I hate the words that are about to come out of my mouth, romantic relationship between the two literal children. 
I've talked about people sexualizing the character of Peter Pan before. I will say it many, many times again in the future, I expect. It's just wrong and unnecessary and gross. And if there is one character in the entire world who is never going to be a romantic lead, it is Peter Pan. But anyway, moving on, back to the character of Wendy Darling not being able to save herself from a fucking wall. Moving on. The next moment that really stood out to me while thinking about Wendy Darling as a strong, changed female character was when they are landing at the Black Castle and Peter has two swords. He gives Wendy a sword and he says, can you use it? And Wendy immediately just goes, ting, 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 and starts fighting him. Peter looks vaguely impressed and then makes her promise to leave Hook to him. Now that as a scene seems fine, but <laughs> the big question I came out of the cinema thinking when I first watched that movie was, when did Wendy learn how to fight with a sword? Now sure, you could make the argument that because a lot of the things that you dream about and imagine become real when you go to visit the Neverland, that's more physical things, like how the island looks and you having a pet wolf, or the home that you live in, like an upturned boat on the sands of the beach, that kind of thing. You can't literally matrix style will yourself to learn fighting and karate or whatever. So that's an argument I'm not so willing to accept. All they had to do to explain why Wendy knows how to fight, because again, Practicing in your bedroom with a toy sword just isn't the same, and believe me, I've tried. Wendy could have just had a lesson in school where she's being taught how to fence or something, or her and her brothers could go to the park and be taught by somebody. There could have been a moment, again, this is what you could have done by not including the scene where you have the bank and Wendy being scolded and Nana going frying and all that stuff. That five minutes of screen time could have been used to explain how Wendy Darling learned how to fight with a sword. I know what they wanted to do. They didn't want Peter to teach her. They wanted Peter to be pleasantly surprised that Wendy Darling can fight with a sword. Not just because she's a girl, perhaps because she's a girl, that's more John's thing. We'll talk about John in another video. Woo! So they wanted Peter to be pleasantly surprised that Wendy Darling can in fact fight with a sword. Fair enough, I get why they want to do that. Again, I disagree with giving her a sword in the first place, but moving on from that. And clearly what they also didn't want was for Peter to teach her. They didn't want to include a scene where Peter shows her how to fight with a sword. Okay, again, sure, they want her to do it on her own and be on her own merits and be her own strong female character. And by Peter teaching her a skill and her learning it, that would somehow take away from it. I disagree, but all right, sure. All they had to do was explain how she learned how to fight because it's basically just glaring plot hole at this point and it sort of Mary Sue's her character a little bit. So yeah, Wendy Darling being able to fight. <laughs> I'd just like to take another quick pause to mention once again how much I fucking love Jason Isaacs. While re-watching this movie, I did not skip any of his scenes except for the one at the end where he's going, oh, it's alone, done for, because that's just so not Hook, it's unreal. But the rest of the time, oh my god. Moving on then to the next moment that really stood out to me when I was looking at Wendy being an edited and adapted strong character and stuff like that. So it's that fairy dance scene. Yeah, the bit everyone loves with the really beautiful music and they're spinning around in the air and the lighting is fucking fantastic. I wish I could replicate it, but I don't have two coloured lights. They basically got some blue and some pinks and some glowing glitter. It's just, it's the most beautifully lit scene. I really love that scene in terms of how it looks. The content of the scene, not so much. Let's talk about it. Now, at this point in the original story, Wendy Darling and Peter did also have a disagreement that ended up in Wendy deciding she was going to leave the Neverland forever and taking the Lost Boys and her brothers with her. However, in the 2003 movie, the script and the way they decided to write this scene really took away from that moment. They, as I said in my other review, made it far too blatant. Rather than putting things to be read between the lines, everything was just outright stated, which took away from both characters, Wendy and Peter Pan. The thing that I really want to talk about in this moment is when Wendy is saying to Peter that line about, I dare say you have felt love yourself before for something or for someone, aka hint hint, herself. Now, number one, um, no, he hasn't and never will. Moving on. The original Wendy would never have thought that, let alone say it. The original Wendy had inner strength. She had comprehension. She understood people. She understood what Tinkerbell and Tiger Lily felt towards Peter Pan because she herself felt it too. She didn't quite understand the grown-up world of feelings and relationships because, again, she's just a little girl, but she understood it way more than Peter. In fact, 100% more than Peter, who doesn't understand it at all. Peter only knows friend, foe, and family. Those are the three types of relationships Peter knows and are all he will ever know. And while Wendy isn't old enough and mature enough in herself to completely understand romantic relationships, she still understands that they exist and what they can look like when she looks at, say, her mother and father, that kind of thing. And she knows that she wants that. And she knows, original Wendy, knows that Peter doesn't. 
and can't feel like that. And she plays along with the play pretend of Peter playing at being father and her being mother, but she knows that when she asks him, for example, she asks him, Peter, what are your exact feelings for me? He responds, those of a devoted son. And what is the original Wendy Darling's response to that? I thought so, she says. She knew that Peter only viewed her as a mother and a member of the family. She knew that Peter Pan would never grow up and grow into those adult feelings, and she knew that she would never get that from him. And again, that's a big part of the reason why she decided she was going to go home. The 2003 movie, by changing that entire scene, robs Wendy Darling's character of her emotional strength, of her understanding, of her place, really. Instead, making her a fawning, simpering girl, chasing after Peter as he flies away, saying, go home and grow up and take your feelings with you, which, by the way, was so awkward. But anyway, despite what they've been trying to do, this Wendy Darling is not coming across as strong. She's in fact coming across as more needy and more pathetic and more weak. She's still nowhere near as close to the Disney version, but you know, she's getting there. Caveat to say, the actress playing Wendy did an amazing job. All of the actors in this movie did a fantastic job. They are not the problem, the script they were given is. So, seeing as the 2003 movie is severely lacking in her original counterpart's emotional strength, they must be gonna do something really big and awesome with her physical fighting strength, right? Right? Let's talk about it. And now we come to a moment in the movie <laughs> which had me staring at the cinema screen when I first watched it going, huh? That moment is the red-handed Jill pirate storyteller moment. To refresh your memory, if you don't remember this scene, Captain Hook has convinced Wendy Darling to come and join the pirates. She is going to be their storyteller. She is going to be with the pirates and she's going to sail off because Peter Pan can't have feelings and Captain Hook understands her and all this and that. Fair enough. Fine. Interesting plot choice, but fine, okay. The thing is that Captain Hook then says that she needs a pirate name, and Wendy says that she has always thought of calling herself Red-Handed Jill. And to anyone who hasn't read the original story, you may have absolutely no idea why that name is of any significance. Allow me to explain. In the original story, Captain Hook, when he has kidnapped all of the lost boys on the pirate ship, says that he has space for two cabin boys, meaning that two of the boys can survive, become pirates, and not have to walk the plank and, you know, die. Captain Hook offers these roles to John and Michael Darling, and it's at this point that John says that he once thought of calling himself Red-Handed Jack and that would be his pirate name. For anyone who's interested, Michael's pirate name was Blackbeard Joe. And so in the 2003 movie, having Wendy say her pirate name would be Red Handed Jill, what they're trying to do is make a callback to John's pirate name, Red Handed Jack. The problem is that at no point in the movie did John actually say that was his pirate name. So what we're left with is Wendy Darling choosing the name Red Handed Jill, and it will mean absolutely nothing to anyone who hasn't read the original story. So then, why bother including it? I feel like I've said that quite a lot in this video. Again, this could be very easily fixed. All they had to do was take out the two stupid scenes of Nana colliding into the bankers and everything going flying, take out the stupid scene of Wendy drawing the picture of Peter Pan, oh, blah, 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 remove all of that, and instead include a scene, perhaps in their fencing lesson that the Darling children were having at school, where John Darling, playing as a pirate, proclaims that his name is Red Handed Jack. And perhaps while John is doing that, that's the point at which he calls Wendy Darling girly. So there you go, two birds with one stone. Explain how Wendy Darling knows how to fight and explain why she chose the name Red Handed Jill. I'm a friggin' genius, and it took me all two minutes to think of that. It also could have been a really good moment when Wendy was back in the home under the ground, telling the lost boys that she was in fact red-handed Jill, especially if this moment happened in front of John. You could even have had the scene cut after Captain Hook said, what's your name going to be? And have Wendy sort of smiling in that knowing way, and then cut to the home under the ground, and then reveal the name in front of John later. It would have been a much more powerful moment for Wendy's character, or at least the strong female character they were trying to present her as in this movie, rather than a throwaway reference of Red Hat and Jill that nobody who hasn't read the original story would get. Alternatively, you have my even better idea. Personally, I think it would have made a lot more sense to Wendy's story, and you wouldn't have had to include any extra scenes involving her and John having a fight and John proclaiming his name as Red Handed Jack. No, no. It would have made way more sense if when Captain Hook said to Wendy Darling, what name are you going to have? What's your pirate name going to be? Wendy had said, Cinderella. 
Now, this may sound counterintuitive because I'm talking about making Wendy into a strong female character. Again, I will argue that a lot of the princesses are in fact strong characters in their own ways, but moving on from that for the moment. What did we find out about Wendy Darling at the very beginning of this movie? What was the first scene we had? What was the first thing we found out about Wendy Darling? She is playing as Cinderella and she has changed the story and she's a badass fighting pirates. So what would have been a really great way to bring Wendy's character arc all the way full circle? Think about it. Wendy Darling is playing as Cinderella, fighting and adding in all these extra things to the story to make presumably Cinderella a strong female character, just like the new Wendy Darling is in 2003. Anyway, she's telling all these stories about this badass Cinderella. She tries to tell more of them. Her Aunt Millicent tells her that she shouldn't be doing that and tries to repress that. Her parents join in. Again, the original parents would not have done this, but moving on from that, they tell her that she has to stop telling all these stories, stop living in a fairy tale. She's growing up, she has to have her own bedroom and stop, 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 stop. She runs away to the Neverland where she can in fact have all these adventures and do the unfulfilled ambition that she wants to do. And she can have all the adventures she wants to write her novels about, right? She gets to fight and be with the pirates. And now at the climactic moment when she has been sword fighting and she is joining a pirate crew and she gets to have her own agency and all this big stuff, what name should she choose to bring her arc full circle? Cinderella. And she is being that version of Cinderella. She has become that version of Cinderella that was in the story that she was telling in the first place. Imagine how much better that would have been. But no, we don't get that. Our strong female character version of Wendy Darling in the 2003 movie gives us red-handed Jill. A, again, throwaway reference that nobody will get unless they've read the original story, which let's face it, not many people have. I need a drink. Ugh. There may or may not be rum in this now. This next moment really niggled me. I didn't catch it the first time I watched this movie because I was so incensed by many other things. <sighs> After we've done all that, right? And it actually makes it worse if Wendy had done all the big culminating arc and we'd known why she was calling herself Red Handed Jill or she called herself Cinderella. It would have made this moment far worse. Okay, after all that, right? Wendy is down in the home under the ground and Peter comes home saying that he has learned that there's a new pirate on board the Jolly Roger and she's called Red Handed Jill and there's another adventure. They're going to go and fight her. What's the next thing that happens? So Wendy has her moment where she stands up and she's like, ready yourself, Pan, for I am red-handed Jill. Oh no, mother and father are fighting again. You know, that was a funny line. I'll give him that. And Peter looks both downtrodden and confused and angry. And Jeremy Silver does a fantastic job of having all those emotions on his face at once. And Wendy is brandishing the sword and saying, ready yourself, Peter Pan. <laughs> and she torments Peter by saying, uh, Hook is a man of feeling and all this, that and the other, right? And it's all building and building and building and building and building and building to Wendy and Peter having a fight. And I timed it. So she's brandishing a sword at Peter Pan and she's ready to fight him because somehow this strong female character knows how to fight that we never had it explained to us, but she knows. Wendy knows how to fight. She's ready and she's ready to fight Peter Pan and she's got a sword and she's saying, ready yourself, Peter Pan. I'm red-handed Jill and Hook is a man of feeling and blah, blah, blah. And Peter and her clash their swords together and have a fight. How long do you think that fight lasted? The culminating moment of that entire piece of Wendy's character arc. I'll let you have a guess. Throw your guesses down in the comments below. I will give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I gave you five seconds. That was two and a half seconds longer than the fight between Wendy and Peter Pan. Yep, I timed it. Wendy and Peter Pan's big fight lasts 2.07 seconds. Less than three seconds. And again, as I say so many times with this movie, I'm left going, what was the point of that? What a complete waste of screen time. I mean, yeah, it was only two seconds of screen time, but still, think of what else we could have done with two seconds. We could have seen more Tinkerbell. We could have seen more of the Lost Boys. We could have had a nice panning shot of some scenery. Panning, do you get it? That was a pun. Now, no, I'm not saying that in any universe, Wendy would have won this fight with Peter Pan. No, of course she wouldn't, but they could have made it last a little longer. But they didn't. Strong female character, go! Now, arguably, the strongest thing that Wendy Darling does do in that scene, in the original and in the 2003 movie, is making the decision to return home. Now, in the movie, she makes that decision for a completely different series of reasons than she does in the original, but the decision is still made, and her brothers go with her, and the Lost Boys all want to go too, and she takes all of them and leaves Peter by himself. And the problem, once again, that we have with the 2003 movie, by trying to make her so strong female character and give her the sword and the fight and everything, instead of it being Wendy's empowering moment of, 
we're going home right now because I'm scared our parents might have forgotten about us. We need to go right this instant and telling Peter to make the necessary arrangements, which he of course does because Peter Pan would never keep anyone on the Neverland against their will. It's literally canonical. Anyway, moving on. Instead, in the 2003 movie, Wendy declares that she's going home and taking her brothers with her after being defeated in her, for lack of a better word, sword fight with Peter Pan. Peter defeats her, ting, 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 and it's done. The moment is done. Wendy has a sword at her throat and she's lost. And then she says, we're going home. And that's not a strong, powerful character moment. The decision should still be strong, but because it comes after her defeat, it actually comes off as almost her running away or her giving up. It doesn't come across as the strong, powerful, plot-shaping move that it was in the original. The next moment is that turning pink kiss moment, and to be honest, the less said about that, the better. Oh, I could do a whole video on that, but I'm not gonna. All I will say about it in the context of this video is that it not only completely destroys all of the character and personality of Peter Pan himself, but it also weakens Wendy once again. It makes her an accessory. She is just standing there, smiling adoringly, in awe of Peter Pan. I mean, obviously everyone should be in awe of Peter Pan anyway. That does not regain her any strong points. It doesn't claw it back. As I've said many times before in this video, it doesn't add anything. It was unnecessary. And if anything, it kind of takes away from her character by making her just an accessory to the plot rather than a force that's driving it. And then we have the return home. And to top it all off, this whole red-handed Jill, pirate, strong, fighting sword, adventure thing, she just goes back to exactly the life that she was so desperate to leave in the first place. So what we left- Buddy. Oh my god. The dog has literally just buried his head in the cushions. It's fucking adorable. Okay. Run! So, what we are left with is a Wendy darling who, as far as we can tell, didn't have a character arc and didn't change. Although, arguably, if they are trying to make her a strong female character, then they probably don't think that she needs to change. And the Wendy in the original story also did not need to change. So at least, hey, that's keeping in theme. The problem is nothing is resolved. Wendy goes back to the exact same situation that she left and by all accounts is as equally unhappy to do it. She doesn't ever say that she's happy to grow up and she's looking forward to it. She just wants to go home. She's sick of Peter Pan and she doesn't want to be a pirate. So they decide to go home. It feels like she's either settling for a scenario that she doesn't like or it's her only option and she's forced into it no matter what. Again, the original Wendy was not and would never, but the 2003 movie does nothing to resolve it. It's just left open and there. They're all delighted to be at home. Okay, after all the hugging and the kissing and a week of being delighted to see each other again is over, then what? Aren't Millicent still gonna feel the same way? The darling parents, the versions of them in this story, are still gonna feel the same way. Wendy is going to have to leave the room and grow up. Maybe it's a lesson that you can't fight the inevitable. I don't know, but that feels like a bit of a downer. And again, it's not explained, it's not touched upon. She just returns home and it's never spoken about again. <laughs> so I guess it's all fine then, right? And think about this as well. The Wendy Darling that we have in the 2003 movie ends up returning to the life that she ultimately wanted to abandon because she didn't want to be forced to do all the things they were forcing her to do and will still force her to do at the end of the story to try to have the adventures that she wanted. But over the course of these adventures, she didn't manage to join the pirates and become a storyteller like she sort of planned. She didn't manage to defeat Peter Pan either in verbal arguments or in a physical fight. And her decision to return home actually ended up coming after this defeat. So really what we're given at the end of the story is a defeated Wendy, rather than the strong, powerful decision maker who drove the plot and was ready to grow up and happy to grow up and ended up growing up a day earlier than everybody else that we got in the original story. So what should we learn from all this then? Just never bother trying to make a strong female character ever again. No, obviously not. Strong female characters, strong any characters, any gender, which are, strong characters are great. We need strong characters. I think my argument is that any character can be strong. There are so many people out there who are not physically strong or want to fight or want to be in the spotlight or want to do any of those typically strong female character or just strong character things. And that doesn't make them any less strong as people. 
And by stripping down all these old characters like Wendy Darling and reimagining her as this strong sword fighting person, you're not doing what you think you're doing by doing that. How many times can I say doing in one sentence? Wendy Darling doesn't need to be turned into a strong female character because she already is. While it can be a lot of fun to take classic old characters from stories we all know and reimagine them and reinvent them in new and interesting ways, we need to be careful not to fall into the trap of thinking that if a female or female presenting character is not physically or visually strong, that they need to be rewritten. The biggest flaw in the 2003 movie's portrayal of Wendy Darling in attempting to update, reimagine and create this strong badass female character is that they simply thrust a sword into her hand and expected that to be enough. As always, if you've enjoyed any of my content and you'd like to support me in a myriad of different ways, you can join me on my Patreon page! It starts at $3 a month. You want to support me for $3 a month? You got it? I got it? We, we, can, we, can, we can work and do wonderful things together. Woo! Let's do it. So, Patreon. I'll put a link on the dingling. Bing! Patreon. Things. You can see things behind the scenes. I post stuff. What I'm up to. Things! Things! More things! Photos of the dog. Many, many, many wonderful things. Also, if you'd like, you can go onto my Kofi page, where you can support me as and when you would like to. It's not such a monthly commitment as my Patreon. Also over on my Kofi page, you can find my shop, which has various things in it. I am updating it soon. I'm getting around to it. And you can also find my commissions. Now, I've got two different types of commissions. Number one is my personalised in-character messages, where you get to write me a script or just give me a rough idea, and I will do a personalised in-character message for you or for someone of your choosing. And these characters can be Mollymock Chileaf, Lucian the Nonagon, Kingsley Chileaf the Pirate, or you can have a Shakespearean soliloquy penned for you or for someone else from Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream, or you can have, of course, a message directly from the Neverland from Peter Pan and you can specify which Peter Pan outfit you want me to be wearing at the time. I have four now, I believe. So yeah, you can pick which one of those you want. The second type of commission that I do is creating stuff. As you may know, I am a cosplayer and I make costumes and if you would like me to make a costume or a piece of a costume, like a hat or something that you would like for your very own, then you can hit me up in my Instagram DMs or you can chuck a message down in the comments below. In the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. I love you all very much, my wonderful jelly spoons. Thank you for all sticking around with me through this chaotic video. I promise to bring you some more Halloween-y content for the rest of the month. There are three Monday Madnesses left for the month of October and I am going to be bringing you Halloween-y spooky wooky content. Content. <laughs> Pat and pending Morcus noise. Spooky wiki content. So enjoy the rest of your week and I will see you next Monday. This is empty. I will see you next Monday. Goodbye. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Unless it's me. Wanna be seen by wanna be messed up.